Hello, everybody. Welcome to an exciting edition of the Nicholas Snow Show on Promo Homo TV, which expanded into a full-fledged online broadcast network in June of 2020. And uh, the whole purpose of the show is connecting the circuitry of humanity by creating programming for LGBTQ plus everyone. And uh, one of the things I love about my guest today is he has written another book that really is for everyone. No Way They Were Gay, Hidden Lives and Secret Loves is the latest book in the Queer History Project from author Lee Wind. Um, and uh, in the uh, remarks prepared to go with the book are, are these. History sounds really official, like it's all fact. Like it's definitely what happened, but that's not necessarily true. History was crafted by the people who recorded it. And sometimes those historians were biased, I would say more than sometimes, those historians were biased against, didn't see, or couldn't even imagine anyone different from themselves. That means that history has often left out the stories of LGBTQIA plus people, men who loved, loved men, women who loved women, people who loved with without regard to gender, and people who lived outside gender boundaries. Historians have even censored the lives and loves of some of the world's most famous people, from William Shakespeare to a pharaoh whose name I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce, to Cary Grant and Eleanor Roosevelt. So we're going to be speaking with author Lee Wind today. It's going to be a fascinating discussion, and I'm really glad that you are here for it. I also want to thank for their support, DAP Health, serving all of Riverside County, but based right here in Palm Springs, California, keeping me alive and thriving, and locally 849 Restaurant and Lounge. Uh, I'm so honored that I get to work with them because they have fabulous food. For those of you around the world that watch the show, uh, that like to travel to Pride celebrations, I've been authorized to uh, ask you to save the date for Greater Palm Springs Pride. And the big events usually happen at the end of Pride Week, in this case, uh, November 5th through the 7th. And we're likely to have a lot of people because it's one of the few Pride celebrations that's happening late enough in the year for us to be opened back up enough for something significant to happen. Um, now, for those of you in the Coachella Valley, if you're feeling isolated and lonely and disconnected, uh, you just want more in your life, especially after perhaps spending a year in isolation, check out the centercv.org. The LGBT Community Center of the Desert has all kinds of wonderful things available for you. And Promo Homo TV merch is now on Amazon. By all means, uh, check it out. Send me a photo with you in the merch, and with your permission, I'll feature it in the show. In June, I'm launching a limited series on Promo Homo TV, focusing on my book, A Living Powerfully with HIV Memoir, written as I lived it, called Life Positive, A Journey from the Center of My Heart to the center of my heart. So check that out if you want to join in that uh, episodic series that will last through World AIDS Day, which is December 1st. In the book, I write about the creation of a worldwide music video campaign. And the, the, the music video is subtitled in 21 languages on YouTube, or you can ask your smart speaker to play the song. I like to get really promo homo with this particular announcement. I am an actor, and if you're in casting and you think I might be right for your project, by all means, check out that link. Now, this show is powered by the Promo Homo TV superstars, and here's more about that.
those paparazzi, they get me every time. Uh, I wanted to remind you that if you are watching this show live and you have a question or you make a comment, I can feature you on screen like this. My friend and regular viewer, Paul, says, hello, Nicholas. He's not just my friend. He's one of my great and longest uh, uh, wonderful supportive friendships. He says hello to everyone and says it's a great topic. I have to agree with him. I think that uh, we're all going to be fascinated by what author Lee Wind has to say right after this. And I just can't get enough of your energy. I just can't get enough. You're the light in the middle of the night and I just can't get enough. Oh, 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 oh. oh. So Lee Wynn's superpower is stories, true and fictional, that center marginalized kids and teens and celebrate their power to change the world. Closeted until his 20s, Lee writes the books that would have changed his life as a young gay kid. His master's degree from Harvard didn't include blueprints for a time machine to go back and tell these stories to himself. So Lee pays it forward with a popular blog with over 3 million page views, I'm Here, I'm Queer, What the Hell Do I Read, and books for kids and teens. His latest book is the middle grade nonfiction No Way They Were Gay, Hidden Lives and Secret Loves. Uh, and uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. So without further delay, I'm going to welcome to the show Lee Wind right now. Hi, Lee. Welcome. Hi, Nicholas. Really excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. And this seems like very trivial, but you're one of the few people that I work with that sends me a publicity photo that looks just like they do now. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as someone who's also a performer, I, I always try to use recent accurate photos because I don't want people to be shocked when they see me and, and your photo is delightful. As a matter of fact, looking at your picture and looking at you is like looking at twins. So, oh, Thank um, you. Yeah, um, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic has changed my look a little bit, but... <laughs> I it's, think uh, it's changed. It's, it's changed us a lot. Uh, so, I remember when I was young. Even when I had no clue that I would grow up to identify as gay, I was always fascinated to learn about famous people in history who were in fact gay, and yet today a lot of that history remains hidden. Do you can you remember Nicholas, the first person that you you learned was gay in history? Oh, wow. Sorry, I didn't mean to stump you. Oh, well, you know, one of the people, one of the people, this isn't a historical figure. Well, now this person would be historical, but I remember the rumors that Rock Hudson uh, was gay mm -hmm. at a time when he was closeted and pre AIDS epidemic. I remember hearing in junior high school about that possibility. Um, but yeah. ultimately, uh, I would I know I, I actually can't be more specific than that. I just remember that any time I learned about a famous person, either contemporaneously or historically, who was a member of the rainbow community, uh, uh, it was always kind of delightful and surprising. Yeah, surprise. I, that was actually the whole unifying theme behind the book. I just I kept being surprised. Like the very first goosebump moment I had was. I went to a, a talk and, and the speaker was explaining that they read the, he read the letters between Abraham Lincoln and Joshua Fry Speed, and he became convinced that Abraham was in love with Joshua. And I just couldn't get past that. And I just for days kept thinking about it. And I decided, all right, I'm going to go to the library and get the letters. And I did. And I, I was, as my bio said, I was closeted until, yeah, yeah, there you go. 
I was closeted until um, I was in my 20s. And I spent a lot of time in high school and college and grad school dating girls and sort of judging it the right thing to do. My parents were immigrants, so it was sort of like, I, it definitely was what they wanted. It's definitely what, what society told me that I should want, but I didn't feel what I knew I was supposed to feel. And I kept wondering where the feelings ever going to come. Finally, I realized they weren't and I got honest with myself and then with others. And then there's this letter. So Abraham and Joshua lived together. They were very good friends and they lived together for four years. They shared a bed. Um, a lot of historians say that, that there's nothing to read into that um, because that was very common on the frontier, whether Springfield was the frontier or not at that time. It, it doesn't matter. We're not playing CSI history. What's more interesting is looking at the primary source materials and saying, did this person love this other person? So Abraham and Joshua live together and then Joshua moves back to Kentucky and marries a woman named Fanny. And eight months after the wedding, uh, Lincoln writes him a letter and says, are you now in feeling as well as judgment, glad that you're married as you are? For many, but for me, this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated, but I know you'll tolerate it for me. And he ends the letter saying, please tell me quickly, I'm very impatient to know. And we don't have the answer, but we do know it was only a few weeks later that Abraham married Mary Todd. So when I read that, that, that line, that are you now in feeling as well as judgment, glad that you're married as you are, that was all goosebumps for me. Like my whole body was like, oh my gosh, there I was in history. Like that's exactly how I felt all those years. I judged it, but I didn't feel it. I hoped the feeling would come. And I suddenly was like, maybe it's true. Maybe Abraham Lincoln was in love with this guy, Joshua Fry Speed. And then I started to really get into the research and, and realize that um, it, I, I'm completely convinced that Abraham was in love with Joshua. Um, and it was like the first crack in this false facade of history. History has been taught, or at least it was taught to me, and I believe it still is being taught in our country is like, basically the story of straight, rich, white men from Europe who were able-bodied and cisgendered. Like, it, it didn't include me. And I felt that this, the story of Abraham and Joshua was like the first crack in that facade. And then suddenly all these other stories, I started to collect them and I became, from being a student that really hated history because it was really taught in a very like didactic, you're gonna memorize these names and these dates. Um, it, it, for me, it just sort of opened up and like all these amazing stories and Eleanor Roosevelt and Mahatma Gandhi, that blew my mind completely to learn that Gandhi's, the love of Gandhi's life wasn't his wife, Kasturba, but was this German Jewish architect named Hermann Kallenbach. Like all these stories just started to really feel so exciting and empowering. And that's really what the book is about, trying to let kids and really, when I say kids, it's it's for the kid inside us too, right? As adults, and and I have there's a really nice blurb from a friend of mine, Linda Sue Park, um, who said that the book is for ages 10 to 110, and I like that a lot because I feel like it it's true. I mean, I, I think that these stories are really empowering, and I really took care to not make it my voice primarily. I really wanted to bring forward the voices of these people in history. So the book is really packed with primary sources. It's a lot of poems and news, news clippings and uh, diary entries and uh, a lot of photos of ancient artwork, really trying to make the case that men who loved men and women who loved women and people who loved without regard to gender and people who lived outside gender boundaries is not a new thing. Um, that, that around the world and across time, going back thousands and thousands of years, um, including the Pharaoh Hatshepsut, which uh, was the one that you referenced earlier. Yeah, um, I was not going to try to pronounce that. Uh, and, and sometimes history can be really intimidating, right? Like, like I don't know how to pronounce this. What do I do? Um, and so I tried to, um, remember pop-up videos, how they would have like these fun little things that would pop up next to yeah, somebody? That VH1 was was one of the major sources of those initially. Yeah, so, so I used, that was part of the idea of how the book was designed to make it really fun. And like when you come upon someone's name like Bayard Rustin, how do you pronounce Bayard Rustin's name? So it, it's spelled B-A-Y-A-R-D but it's pronounced Bayard. So there's a little pop-up next to it, as opposed to like a formal footnote. I didn't want the book to feel like medicine. I wanted it to feel like chocolate, like really empowering chocolate. It does. It's very, 
I didn't know until the the top of the show when I was reading the the text that's been created to go with the book that that this was tar- this is targeting middle school individuals because as you said you know from one to a hundred and one or eleven to a hundred and one whatever it is you said it's like uh i it's so it's so refreshing tonight to just leaf leaf through it and one of the things that fascinates me the most is that you give people a guide to go through the book again in chronological order through history yeah, at the very end, I thought, because um, it's not necessarily a book that people are going to read cover to cover, right? I mean, it's it's divided into these three sections, men who loved men, and women who loved women, and people who lived outside gender boundaries. And maybe you just want to read about women who loved women. Um, and But then I, what I was thinking is that I hope that wherever you enter the book, you kind of get really into it. And then at the end, I did have that fun thing where, so there's 12 chapters, so there's 12 people that we go into a book considerable depth on and like Shakespeare and the love sonnets he wrote to another guy. There's probably four sonnets that are fully in it with sort of explanations of how I read it. And um, I wanted there to be enough substance in each chapter to really get the point across that, you know, here's all the evidence. Um, There's hundreds of years for historians who think differently, but this is what I think. And you make your own decision to the reader, you know, you decide what you want. And then there's maybe 12 additional people that are sprinkled throughout where there's just like a really cool tidbit like Michelangelo and the statue of David and how there's a secret in the statue of David, which is super cool, which I didn't discover until I was actually in Italy in the gift shop um, at the museum where, where the actual statue is. And there was a postcard that revealed that this statue that, that he spent three years carving when he was in his 20s has this secret that in the eyes of the statue of David, um, they're they're carved like hearts, which I thought was like incredibly romantic and really really cool. I don't know if you can, if we can yes. really zoomed in enough on that, but yes, that, you're just, to- like wow, what? and it's right there, right? Like every, I mean, it's twenty feet up. Nobody can actually see it from the ground, but it's just incredible that like. You know, this was his ideal of male beauty, and we know he was in love with another other men because there's a lot of evidence. And there's a poem that was translated um, that he wrote to this guy Tommaso de Cavalieri at the time, um, uh, this love poem to another guy that's gorgeous. So it's really exciting to sort of like discover these things that are in full view, right? Like the statue of David, everybody's seen it. We all we kind of think we know it, but there's this really amazing hidden queer history behind it. And that's really exciting. So at the very end, I liked that idea of reshuffling the players in the book and letting you see how history sort of has unfolded over time. Well, you know, when I was looking at the book, one of the things that I was thinking about is this book is probably or needs to be on the development desk of Netflix and everywhere else because there are so many takes on these historical figures that just scream to be put onto the screen, uh, especially like the Abraham Lincoln uh, story about him meeting a guy in a shop to buy a bed that he couldn't afford. So the guy invites him to live with him above the shop and share his bed. And then they continue to share that bed for years after they needed to. I mean, it's like, uh, it I, takes your breath away. It's amazing. And and in fact, it's, it's interesting since I wrote that, I've been working on this book for 11 years. Um, when I went to that talk and heard about those letters from Abraham and Joshua, um, that was 11, 11 plus years ago. So I've been working on this book for a really long time. So like things like the Ann Lister. And so Ann Lister was a woman who lived in England and um, they really lived outside gender boundaries. Um, and, and she had this amazing secret code. She she used this code in her diaries so nobody could read what she was saying. And I actually share the code in the book because I just thought it was so poignant and cool. So like imagine having to write the truth of your life in a secret code where letters like the letter L is um, you know, a symbol and um, the letter a is the number two, so nobody could read it. And there's a de- decoded section of her diary that I share in the introduction where she talks about, um, I love and only love the fair sex, and thus beloved by them in turn, my heart revolts from any other love than theirs. And younger people won't know that that the, the expression, the fair sex, is what the old-fashioned term for women, but 
that's the that's the thing. So it's kind of amazing too. Like, um, and then there is a Netflix. I, I don't know if it's Netflix, but there is a series about Gentleman Jack uh, about uh, HBO. What, yeah, which is what Anne was. That was Anne's nickname, um, Gentleman Jack. So it's fun to see these things unfold. And in fact, there was I I did all the research on the chapter about Queen Anne, um, and uh, Sarah Churchill, and that was the woman she loved, and. Uh, um, kind of you don't want to get in too much in the weeds in terms of the British royal family but like you know the descendant uh, the the ascendant uh, the the ancestor of princess diana and um and uh the 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 young royals um but what was so amazing is that then there was a movie that came out about um that sort of the weird lesbian love triangle um with you know who would who would be queen anne's favorite um, so it is interesting that some of these stories are starting to see the light of day, and yet I still think it's really important to let the primary sources speak. Right, and you know that movie you're referencing is just a couple of years old, and the lead actor, who I'm not going to remember her name, she won the Academy Award for it, I believe. Um, I, yeah, I don't uh, the, actually remember the, the name either. <laughs> right, the name of the film is is. Uh, um, the same actor who plays Queen Elizabeth in the current, uh, ser the recent series of the Queen, uh, was a star of that film. Forgive me for not remembering these names. Thank goodness they weren't my guests today, because then I would have done more research. Um, what is, what is the most heartbreaking discovery you've made in your deep dive into our history? When I say our, the big our, LGBTQIA plus the whole rainbow, what's the most heartbreaking? I think I have two. So if, if you'll indulge me, the first, the first was recognizing how deep my own homophobia went. Um, you know, growing up in our culture where gay is synonymous with bad um, and, you know, being called lots of names when I was a kid. Uh, I smile about it now, but it was really, really hard. And so when I was doing the research for the book, I was just so excited. I was just like, I can't believe that all these amazing, famous people, you know, a footnote to their story is that they were a woman who loved another woman or a man who loved another man, like like Shakespeare or Gandhi or Eleanor Roosevelt. Like, and I just was like all like, you know, patting myself on the back. I'm like, I found this cool stuff and I'm excited to share it. And then I was reading the letters that Mohandas Gandhi wrote to Herman Kallenbach. And there are hundreds of letters and that are now in the public domain. And it started to dawn on me that maybe it wasn't a footnote. Maybe the fact that they were queer was actually part of what made them great. Because, you know, Gandhi, and so I have, um, this is my copy of the, of the book and, and um, I have all these marks on it, which sort of what I imagine like a, a reader would do, you know, oh yeah, that was the really cool section on Gandhi. So if Gandhi was in love with this guy, Hermann Kallenbach, this German Jewish architect, um, maybe that was part of the reason that Gandhi was able to have this amazing breakthrough where he talked about, you know, let people's religions be different. You worship a being, a single entity as Allah and another adores him as Kuda. I worship him as, as Ishwar. How does anyone stand to lose? You worship facing one way and I worship facing the other. Why should I become your enemy for that reason? We all belong to the same human race. We all wear the same skin. We hail from the same land. Like that was a huge breakthrough in sort of like the evolution of, of you know, as, as you say, connecting the circuitry of humanity, right? Like that was this huge moment in, in, in our world. And I think you can make the argument, and I do in the book, that that part of Gandhi's being able to do that was his being in love with another guy. Like, it's not incidental. It's it's part of it. And that becomes really like, whoa, history starts to open up like this flower. And you think about like Eleanor Roosevelt and um, her love of Lorraine, with Lorraine, love affair with Lorena Hickok. Like maybe the fact that Eleanor loved another woman was part of what made her so amazing that she was the one that, um, you know, champion the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, um, you know, in the United Nations. And in fact, there's this beautiful photo of her um, holding up the Spanish language version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, because that was a huge, huge accomplishment. But maybe it was, 
you know, maybe she was that person that did that precisely because she loved another woman. And then I just started to kind of like, it blew my mind. So that was really, it was exciting, but it was also really, um, it made me take pause and realize, wow, I have internalized such hate um, and, and dis, discredited, you know, my own legacy. This is our legacy, right? Like, um, and, and we don't know it, right? Because it's not like my parents sat me down and told me that Alexander the Great was in love with another guy, right? Like <laughs> um, they came with their homophobia from their cult, from, from, from Israeli culture, which came from homophobia from Russian and Poland and Hungary. Um, you know, it gets passed down over generations. What doesn't get passed down are these incredible stories, you know, and, and that for me was really, really exciting. Okay, the second heartbreaking moment. I, I wanted to stop oh, you yeah. for just a second because it's relevant to what you just said. Please. I, if I remember correctly, one of the controversial things about Oliver Stone's movie, Alexander, was the fact that they kind of de-gayed Alexander, uh, that character. And um, uh, I do believe that that's what I've just said is an accurate statement, that if you watch lot. that movie, you don't see, uh, I don't remember, it's been a while, but I think at the time, but one of the issues with the film was that... Uh, they had degayed Alexander. It happens so much. And in fact, um, there's so many ways the history has been sanitized, right? For the protection of the people in power or to make more money, uh, you know, when they tell the story. I do want to move into your second heartbreak. Uh, but I also just want to acknowledge that in this book, in the book, um, you, uh, what I love about it is the inclusivity in the book across uh, ethnicities, countries, and uh, especially your section on um, people living outside gender norms as well, which we can get into. Uh, I just didn't want to forget to say that. And I also want to contrast it to um, what is, there's more awareness around this than ever before, I think. And that is how the same, the same way that our history has been erased so has specifically uh, black history or in the, the history of indigenous people or frankly the the history of most of the world that has been colonized by the evil white man uh, to put it bluntly about what has happened in history mm -hmm. um, so anything that anybody's doing to help expand the consciousness and the awareness about all these issues are, are important so what was the second piece of heartbreaking ex information or experience you had in writing the book? So I was flying high and reading about all these amazing people and, and I was doing the research and trying to do more and find, find out more. And I, there were, I discovered this story this, uh, that there was an autobiography that was written uh, in the 1600s um, and by this person that was born with a woman's body and then uh, was raised in a convent and before they took their vows, they escaped and made their way as a man, uh, as a, a, a soldier to South America and kind of took on all the most horrible, toxic, masculine things they possibly could and murdered people and um, just were, it was, it was so disturbing. It read a bit like an action adventure movie, but it was also really horrible because it was like the worst of like co colonialization and um, just seeing anybody less than themselves as, as anybody different than themselves as less than and not worthy. And yet they were, you know, uh, living their life in, in, as, a, as a gender different than what they were, their body was, or, you know, how, how they presented was this complete flip. And then when they were discovered, for this one murder, um, they ended up confessing that they were born a woman and it became this sensation. They became hugely famous and um, ended up having audiences with the Pope and being kind of celebrated as this, as this celebrity and the Pope granted um, Catalina de Arraso, um, AKA Antonio, uh, uh, Whoops, sorry, forgetting the name. They, they had so many AKAs in the course of their life. Um, so that was an amazingly and fascinating story that yes, is part of our heritage. And it was super disturbing because 
they really took on the worst aspects of what it meant to be a man in Spain at that time um, and in, and in you know, the South America. Um, and then I realized that it was still really important to share because not everything, not everybody in history is going to be perfect. And we have to trust that people, especially kids, are, are mature enough to understand that people are three-dimensional and that sometimes there are some cool things about them and there's some horrible things about them. And I didn't want the book to be cherry-picked. Like this, the chapter on Sappho, um, I didn't, uh, there was a poem that I discovered, uh, a fragment of a poem where she talks about her love for a young man. And I, most history books that I've read have been very skewed, right? And they were just, oh, I'm, I'm talking about Safa being in love with women. I'm just not going to include that. But I did, I did include it because I think that that's really important. Whenever any evidence came up that contradicted what I was trying to show, I included it because I think that we can all handle the fact that history is complicated and people are complicated. One of the things, uh, and I appreciate that you were in, inclusive of that particular piece of information and that your goal was to really expand consciousness and awareness. Um, how does this book get into people's hands other than individuals learning about it is there a program for the book to end up in schools how do you how do you, how do you your books reach the the desired audiences so in a bunch of ways i mean one way was that um i've teamed up with uh my local indie bookstore and with um uh, nonprofit Brave Trails, and we're letting people donate copies. They can purchase them from the bookstore. I'll sign them, and then we're giving them to the um, uh, LGBTQ kids and teens that are attending Brave Trails uh, camp this summer. Um, and it's a sort of LGBTQ leadership camp for for young people. So that's one very direct way that that's happening. Um, the other is that you know it. It's really, I'm, I've been doing a lot of outreach to librarians and trying to get them to bring the book in because, uh, you know, having the book in the library is a statement in and of itself, um, it, which is really important. And the, uh, the publisher has been really great about really reaching out. We created a sort of a discussion guide that, that uh, teachers can use, which is free and downloadable from their website. And I'm going to get it up on my website. Uh, so there's a lot of ways. I'm definitely, you know, if any listener has a connection to a curriculum or teachers or, um, you know, knows somebody at Glisten or a P flag that they want to connect it to, please do. It's really a word of mouth um, thing as we try to expand it. I mean, I joke that it's it's a book, but it's really an empowerment tool to get uh, young young queer people in particular to see that they have a past and that because they know that they have a past. They know that they deserve a place at the table today. And if they know they deserve the place at the table today, they can imagine any kind of future for themselves. And that's well. The in, in addition to it being a book, I also hope that it is a tease about what we're going to start seeing on Netflix in about three years. <laughs> I'm like waiting for that too. Um, now, I I know that you. Uh, have a lot more to say about this book in particular, but before we go there, tell me about the queer history project in general. Sure. So um, I, I envision that this book is the first of three books in a series, and I'm actually writing the second one now. And um, it's it's not trying to be an encyclopedia. I, I I'm not going to do that. Like I'm I'm also trying not I'm not trying to duplicate what you can find in a Google search online. What I'm trying to do is, is highlight some specific moments to help kids and everyone else rethink what we've, what we've been taught about different things. Like one thing is history, right? Like the Queer History Project, this, is, this book is about people. No way they were gay. The second book is about gender and how gender is this social construct that in our culture seems so immutable. And yet now we're seeing some 20 somethings and some teenagers being more um, thinking about gender differently than when we were taught gender, right? And that, that book just screams that it's going to get attention. 
because of the context in which it's coming out it just it's it it just seems like wow that's going to be just a hot book it just is so important right because if we recognize it as i'm working on it that i you know you get to pull like one quote and put it in the beginning of the book and it's called an epigraph and it's like this is what i'm trying to say so for this book i'm 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 if you indulge me i'm going to read i this. indulge you the epigraph is by judy gran who wrote the a beautiful adult book about queer history that I love. Um, so when she was 21 years old in 1961, she went to a library in Washington, D.C. Um, and this is what she says. Um, to read about homosexuals and lesbians, to investigate, explore, compare opinions, learn who I might be, what others thought of me, and who my peers were and had been. The books on such a subject, I was told by indignant, terrified librarians, unable to say aloud the word homosexual, were locked away. They showed me a wire cage where the special books were kept in a jail for books. Only professors, doctors, psychiatrists, and lawyers for the criminally insane could see them, check them out, hold them in their hands. And then I wrote after that quote, I wrote, just think you're holding this book in your hands. We've come a long way. So I love that idea that like you can, I know, right? Like the, the, that that's what it was, right? Like books about queer people were locked away and now it's in over a thousand libraries. Uh, so that's really- That exciting. book is already in a thousand libraries? Yeah, it was-, it was weeks, like after, a, weeks after it's come out. It's already yeah, in a thousand there's libraries. There's a thing called junior high, library. High book. five, high Thank five. Thank you, I'll take it. <laughs> You're the um, second person I've done a virtual high five with on my show. It works out well. Because we both it. know where our cameras are. Wow, a thousand libraries, good for you. Thanks. It's a junior library guild selection, which means that this, uh, this, it's like a subscription box that librarians do. And so they chose it as one of the books, which means that it's in a thousand libraries. So that's exciting. So um, you have a book that's filled with post-its. Why don't you tell me about your post-it process? And also, if there is anything that you wanted to talk about today in the interview that we haven't gotten to yet, let's move into those topics as well. Sure. Well, first, let me say that when I'm working on Gender Bender, the quote I have in the beginning that sort of is for, like to reset your thinking is by Alok Ven Vaid Menon. And it's that there are as many genders as there are people in the world, which I think just sums it up perfectly. So the post-its are um, because there's, when I talk about the book, there's so many things I want to reference. And I'm like, oh yeah, I want to talk about um, Christine Jorgensen. So I can like turn to that quote and I can share it because Christine Jorgensen was world famous in um, the 1950s and 60s. Show, for show her picture, show the page, there she is. Yeah. And to say a little bit more about Christine because there are a lot of people today that don't know. So, yeah, and that's amazing, right? Like this person who's the most famous person in the world in the 1950s, um, literally, like they did a study and she was the most written about person in the entire world for a couple of years there. Um, and people don't even know who she is today. And, and yet, you know, this is the first person to become world famous for changing their body to match their internal sense of gender. And um, she wrote a uh, friend's this amazing thing. She said, I think we, the doctors and I are fighting this the right way. Make the body fit the soul rather than vice versa. So every, every chapter sort of opens with a quote. And, I'm um, not a member of the trans community, but even, even as a cis white male, that gives me goosebumps to know that that life story exists. And I imagine for people that are trans identified in some way, shape or form, that that is a very powerful story. Yeah, and for me too. I mean, I'm I'm the G of LGBTQIA2+, and I've I've learned that my job is to be an ally to everybody else, to all the other. By letters. the by the way, what does the two mean? I don't oh, ever remember seeing that. Oh, two spirit. Okay, well, that's it. You do, you address that in your book too. So let's talk about that. I do. Yeah. Um. So there's a chapter on Wewa. Um. And sometimes it's hard because we don't have. The, the primary sources in the way we might want them, right? I don't have, so Wewa was um, a member of the Ashiwi and uh, what, what we call in English Zuni um, nation. And um, they, there was this whole kind of amazing story of um, these anthropologists that went uh, to uh, that, that, uh, nations uh, to sort of study their culture and the people 
And then Weiwa went back with Matilda Stevenson to Washington, D.C., um, and was written about in the newspaper and celebrated as a princess of the Zuni tribe. And then when it later they, it was revealed that they were not a woman, that they were a third gender, it wasn't understood at the time. And it became like a laughing stock and um, really tragic. And it was very hard to kind of find moments where we could actually hear Weiwa and see. And Matilda Stevenson, the, the sort of white, uh, uh, one of the first women to work in the, in the sciences um, and be employed uh, after her husband died, she sort of took over the, the, the anthropology and, and wrote this incredibly uh, long and, and remarkable sort of analysis and study of, of the Zuni culture, um, of the Ashiwi culture. Um, it was super fascinating to sort of read that those accounts and, and get to sort of see these little glimpses, these little moments. Like there's this whole story that that's in the book that of of Wewa gathering clay because they were they created pottery and it was one of these um, th this art form that was very appreciated both within their culture and without. Um, so they're an example of someone that you know lived within the gender boundaries of their culture, but outside the gender boundaries of Western culture, the sort of this colonialist, you know, culture that came in. And a lot of that chapter is talking about colonialism and about how um, the mistreatment of native people and native culture and how it's made it so hard to document and to find these stories. Um, and the stories of women too. I mean, you know, finding the stories of women of, of color, like we all have to listen harder and dig deeper and and recognize that wow men get a lot of the spotlight in history and it, that's not cool and not fair because there are yes mempo nothunya i love discovering the autobiography that uh, mempo did and it was so incredible to read about so i'm going to my little my sticky notes here right so um mempo showed us that in lesotho culture there were these, you know, recognized and celebrated relationships of love between women. And um, Mempo was married and her Motswale was also married, each married to a man. But together, they also had a relationship that was celebrated. And in Mempo's own words, she talks about um, how, um, okay, one day, I'm going to read just a little bit. Please, go right ahead. One day, my Motswale said she wanted to come to her house for a feast to celebrate our friendship. She cooked for days to get ready, and even me. I made much bread and joala. Okay, um, that's sort of the, the pop-up video moment. Joala is a type of homemade beer. Um, and two chickens to add to her feast. I went to her house with five women, my husband, and two other men. When we arrive at her house, we find that she has prepared a sheep. She sh shows us the sheep and says, there is your food. It was like a wedding. And the, the description of the celebration goes on. And it's just amazing and to know that like before sort of Western homophobia was imported like Robert Mugabe and you know in Uganda like before homophobia from the west took root in in these countries in Africa there was this vibrant tradition of love between women that existed and that was celebrated publicly that was so exciting to discover so the the point of that chapter including it wasn't that Mempo was famous but like she stands there for everyone's story that we don't have. Amazing. I would like for one of the things that you just reminded me that I wanted to ask you about is speak speak a bit. What even if it's not in, uh, specifically covered in your book, I'm I know it is a little bit, but talk about the history of homophobia. Mm. So I think a lot of it is about. I think a lot of it's about fear, and I also think a lot of it is about language um, I've, and, and control. I think so much of how history has been sanitized is about power and control, and you know who tells the story of history. Uh, in the very beginning of the book, I have um, a, a thing for kids to think about, like imagine they get into a fight at school. So whose story is the principal going to believe? Um, it sort of depends on what not just what you say and what the kid you had a fight with says, but like who was the third person that saw it happen, right? Like what if that person was your friend? What if that person was the other kid's friend? What if that person is the principal's child? Like it, the stories of history have been sort of adapted and, and, and 
twisted and changed according to who was empowered, who was telling the stories. And it's really important for us to recognize that history is an interpretive dance. And we all have the ability to go back to the primary source materials and sort of like just set aside the other historians for, for the moment. They've all had hundreds and thousands of books to, that they've been written, writing about their sanitized version of history. Let's let the people in history tell us their stories. And that's really what I was trying to, to get to. So I would like to give you the opportunity to choose one more post-it that we haven't talked about that is the most important additional thing that you want to make sure gets it into this, uh, which what, what I imagine is one of the more comprehensive interviews you've done about the book. So yeah, it's great. let's make sure it includes whatever you're about to share now. Okay, well, let's make sure it includes Hatshepsut because we have this thing in the queer community that we are all about queer history beginning at the Stonewall Revolution in 1969. And I, I have nothing but admiration for those drag queens and trans people that, that finally stood up to the police and was like, enough is enough. And that was the beginning of this sort of modern civil rights movement for queer rights. But it wasn't the beginning of queer history. And I think that you can go back you know, 2,000 plus years to this pharaoh in Egypt, Hatshepsut. And over the course of ruling Egypt for 22 years, they completely changed how they presented their gender. So they started out as a 16-year-old daughter of the pharaoh, wife of the pharaoh. They married their siblings back then because they wanted to keep the royal line pure. Um, and then, so, so here's, there's three images in the book that I, I um, share. So this you one, come, you can come yeah. closer. Okay, so let me see. So it starts out at the beginning of whoops. Uh, I can see backwards. them all. Yeah. Okay. At the beginning of their rule, they were presented completely as a woman, and then as um, as their co rulership, the co kingship progressed, they their their presentation changed. So now they're presented more masculine, but still with sort of feminine seeming breasts, but um, the, the attire has changed and it's masculine attire and no shirt. Um, and so there's this really in fascinating in-between stage. And then another um, number of years on, um, I think this was nine years into the, their, um, their ruling uh, Egypt, they're presented completely masculine, completely with a beard, uh, squared off shoulders, and you see this in so many of the sort of archeological evidence of um, Hatshepsut, and in fact, even changing their name, um, but never changing their pronoun. It, it was really, really amazing to recognize, and I think incredibly inspiring and, and empowering for genderqueer kids today to, to recognize that like being genderqueer is not brand new. You know, there is this amazing legacy and I think that if there's one message from the book, it's that like, you're not alone, whoever you are, however you identify, whoever you love, you're not alone, which is exciting, right? We have a history and um, that means everything. That is such a fantastic uh, place to land on at the end of this conversation. Um, uh, would you like to make a final remark? Uh, just that language is really important. And I think that the word homosexual does not help our community because straight people hear it and all they think of is sex and how the way we have sex and what we do sexually. And I just think if we were talking more about love, this is the thing I said earlier that this isn't CSI history. Like I don't need to go and prove that you know, with DNA evidence that Abraham Lincoln was had had intimate relations with Joshua Fry Speed. I think it, that what we need to do is look at love. And if the word was homo lovable, if we were talking about homo lovable rights and homo lovable history, we'd have a very different cultural conversation. So I leave I leave your listeners, your viewers, with with that thought. What if it was homo lovable? Well, one of one of the ways I've had that same conversation to differentiate who who human beings are versus what the small part of their sexuality expression might be, uh, especially around the issue of coming out when someone says, well, why do you have to flaunt it? 
And really, when we're just simply being ourselves, other people would view that as flaunting it. So around a workplace, you might say, imagine if you had to eliminate any evidence whatsoever from your expression and conversations about the existence of your partner. Yeah. It has nothing to do with sex. That's probably not what is in other people's consciousness. It's everything else about their lives. So it comes down to our individual humanity. And one of the things that I, that I have uh, come to know around the whole complexities of gender identity is basically someone's gender identity is who they know and declare themselves to be. That's yeah. my take on that. If we can let, if we can get to a world where everyone can be their authentic selves now or soon, wouldn't that be better? I mean, I know that I was actively closeted from 11 to 25, and and I just I wish I had known any of these stories. It would have changed everything for me. So like the idea that like we can be having this conversation and it might help somebody listening feel like they have the courage to be their authentic self sooner. I mean, I want them to be safe. You, know, you gotta be safe first. But the, the idea that we can shift the world to being more safe for people to be their authentic selves now, that's the dream. And that's a dream I support. Uh, Lee, I wanna thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much. Stay tuned, I wanna talk to you backstage. And for those of you who are watching, I've showed you throughout the broadcast how to find the book. If you go to uh, promohomo.tv as well, there's more information about Lee, his work, and of course, the book. I, at the top of the show, I said this show is about connecting the circuitry of humanity by creating programming for LGBTQ plus everyone. And I think that we rose to that occasion today. I will see you next time. And I just can't get enough of your